You will fight for me. You'll do what's right for me. Oh, I, go. I believe it. All right, so you can. 35 seconds. Good morning, Christ Community Church. 
Good morning. I'm so happy to be here after I, I personally had a very long week. Uh, but all week I've been thinking about Brother Dave Lyons uh, message. So thank you for your message. If you haven't seen it, tune in on YouTube and catch that uh, from uh, October 30th. OK, that was a very good me message. And I can't stop saying Holy Spirit activate <laughs> all week. Um, so thank you for that. But yes, I'm so happy to be here after a long week. I'm ready to uh, be amongst the people so we can worship together. It's one thing you worship alone. I can worship at home, at home my living room all the time. But it's one thing we're at together, just like at a party. You can party and do turn on some line dance music and do it in your living room all by yourself. But it's one thing when you go to the party with your friends and y'all partying together. You know what I mean? So I just love being here on Sunday so I can do that with you all, okay? So could you please stand up and let's worship our king. We're going to sing about how he reigns. We're going to sing how we love to call his name. There's power in his name and how we love him and we exalt him. Please stand and worship with us.
that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What we love to call his name is something that we just can't explain. So just lift your voices and sing with us. Amen. Come on, clap your hands, y'all. We love to call your name is something we cannot explain. When we proclaim your great name, your great name, we love to call your name is something cannot explain. Cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name. much power in your name. Won't you help me sing? There is power in the name of Jesus. So much power. Power in your name. Oh, there is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. Power in your name. So think, James, think, James, when we call you Jesus. Yeah. 
his love for us, not just on the cross, but every day. We just thank you, Lord.
Gracious Heavenly Father, how we love you and give you glory and praise today simply because of who you are. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for everything that you have done, first for saving us, for redeeming us, for giving your very life for us. You tell us in your word that no greater love has this than a man laid down his life for a friend. And then you go on to say, I have called you my friend. And so we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you're just not our Savior, but you are our Father and our friend. We thank you, Lord, that in those moments when life just is beating us down and we just want to sit like a two-year-old in the middle of the floor and cry, but we can't because we're grown-ups and we're supposed to know better how to deal with stuff like that, then in those moments, Father, we can call to you and we can cry to you. And the wonderful thing about you, Jesus, is that you don't say, what is wrong with you? Why can't you figure this out? What? You know, come on. But you listen and you love us and you tell us and remind us that I am here for you. That I died for you. You are mine. And so we praise you, Lord, that in those moments when we can't figure it out, you know already. You figured it out. You know the beginning from the end. And Father, when we listen and yield to your Holy Spirit, confess our sins to you, Lord, and that we're listening with a heart to hear your voice, Father, that you guide us in the way everlasting. And so, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, we give you glory in this place today, Lord Jesus, because there is no other name that is worthy to be glorified and praised and lifted up. And your word tells us that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Father, we're not going to wait till that day. We're going to say it right now. Give you glory to your name, Jesus, because you are worthy of it all, Lord God. We thank you for the man of God. We thank you that we uh, serve a man, uh, that we have a pastor, rather, Lord God, that has honored you not just with preaching the word of God, but with his very life. And so, Father, we pray you continue blessings on him and his family, that you would hide him behind the cross. Lord Jesus, that your word and only your word would be seen, that hearts would be comforted, convicted, Lord Jesus, and encouraged. And Father, we pray that all that we do, all that we've done, has given you glory and honor, and that you smell a sweet aroma raising up to heaven. And as you look down on Christ's community, as well as your other children who are worshiping you this morning, that you are smiling at us and saying, they have given me glory this morning because I know that their hearts are for me. Lord Jesus, we want our hearts to always be for you, Lord God. So we thank you again, Lord God. We thank you that you hear and answer our prayers. We give you glory and honor and praise, and it's your precious name that we do pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Amen, church family. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? God is so worthy. He's so good. He's so deserving of our worship and our praise. And it's such a blessing to be able to gather together on this Sunday morning and to be able to celebrate our great king. I want to welcome everyone to church on this Sunday. Welcome to everyone that may be visiting us for the first time. Welcome to our family. Um, our hope and our prayer is that all of us will encounter the living God. How many of you guys know we come to church to connect with God? We come to this service so that we can commune with the living God. And so our prayer and our hope is that all of us can meet God in very specific, in a very special, in a very unique, very personalized way. But thank you so much for being a part of our church. If you are checking this out for the first time, either at home or if you came to our service today for the first time, again, welcome. If you want to get more information about our ministry, you can always reach us either by phone or phone number. It's 216-417-7958. Um, or you can send us an email. Our email address is info, that's I-N-F-O, at worshipccc.com. Uh, send us an email. We'll get back to you. Uh, but thank you so much for being a part of our church. Amen. Uh, just a few announcements I want to make, and then we're going to move on to the rest of our service. Uh, the first thing is I want to give a shout-out to all of our brothers that came out and played basketball last night. We had Bible and basketball last night. Had, yeah, amen. Praise God. We made it back to church. 
Uh, it was a great time of fellowship, and I just want to say that some of us are a little bit on the broke up side. It is not an opportunity for you to laugh at us, to make fun of us, right, or to talk down on us. What we need is your encouragement because we're going to do it again next Saturday, all right? Maybe we need your encouragement or maybe we need your wisdom not to do it. I don't know which one, uh, but we need a word of encouragement uh, as we go through this season. But we're really excited, and I do want to invite all the men on Saturdays at 7 o'clock. We come together. We, uh, we do get into the word a little bit. Yesterday was more of an introduction. Um, but uh, then we play basketball. We have other activities as well. And so, uh, guys, you are invited to come out um, on those Saturdays at 7 o'clock here at the church to be a part of that. Now, today is a unique kind of Sunday for me. Uh, number one, because I am a little bit broke up, so I'm asking for your prayers for me, not so much for the other guys, mainly for me. Uh, and then, two, I got a swollen eye. I mean, just a lot going on physically with me today. I just want to assure you guys, it did not happen last night. There was no fight, no altercation uh, when we played basketball. It's just, you know, living in a world stained by sin. And so, uh, but you guys continue to pray for us, but it's really a good time. Also want to give a shout out to all of our ladies that gathered together this Sunday morning at 9.30-ish. Give the ladies a hand clap for getting here. They got here before 10, so you're doing good. And they were able to wrap up, and so it's such a blessing to have the ladies come together and uh, uh, feast on the Word of God. I want to give a shout-out to Sister Murphy uh, for putting in all the work to really prepare and uh, lead the lesson. Her and Sister Norma working together. We appreciate you guys so much. I just want to remind the ladies that on every first and third Sundays, we do have that Bible study on Sunday mornings at 930 uh, for you guys. It's a great time for you to travel in the world together. I also want to let the, let the ladies know that on the second and fourth Saturdays, uh, we have our life group that's virtual that meets at 10 o'clock. Um, Sister Celine and Sister Payne are leading that, and that's going to happen this Saturday, right? Um, this Saturday coming up. So I certainly want to encourage you ladies to make sure that you, can, you get connected with that. You can see either Sister Payne or Sister Celine, and they can give you all the information on how you can get um, access to that so that you can be a part of that. And so there's a number of good things happening in our ministry. I encourage you guys to please take advantage of it um, so that we can grow together. I have tons of other announcements, so let me just kind of walk through it one thing at a time. Um, on this Tuesday, last week I got a phone call. Uh, many of you guys know that I uh, do a lot of stuff with TCT. Uh, Total Christian Television. So some of you guys have caught me on Ask the Pastor, um, and um, you know I've developed a relationship with them. Well, they reached out to me last minute, last week, to come on their show this Tuesday to participate in their Celebrate program. They'll need a keynote speaker, and so they invited me to come, and I wanted to make sure I extend the invitation out to you guys. I know it's really short notice, but it is on Tuesday. We've done something like this before, um, where our church congregated. We went out to Akron, Ohio, and, um, and we just celebrated the Lord with them, and uh, we uh, was able to partake on God's word together. So that's going to happen again this Tuesday. Again, I know it's short notice. They let me know short notice. I'm just getting on the details myself together. But if it's something that you would like to do and you have the time availability on this Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, that's the other curveball. It's not in the evening like it was before. It's in the morning. If you have that availability at 10 o'clock in the morning on this Tuesday, see me after service if you want to go out to Akron. If you don't mind your face being on the TV, because uh, they will catch you on there. Um, uh, and if you want to be a part of that, just let me know. But that's going to happen this Tuesday at 10 o'clock out in Akron, Ohio. It's about a uh, half an hour drive. And you guys pray for me. I'm hoping that my eye swelling goes down a little bit because I don't want people to think that Christ Community Church be fighting. Um, and so uh, I, want, I don't want to get that image out there to the world that they pass to be fighting people. He got a swollen eye. And so y'all pray for me about that. But um, it's a blessed time for us to partner with other ministers and other churches. And so, again, that's going to take place this Tuesday at 10 o'clock. You have to be there at 10 o'clock because it is a production. And so you have to be there on time. It can't be 10-ish. It has to be right on 10 o'clock um, or you will miss out. And so if you want to be a part of that, just let me know. Um, after service. I'll let you guys know when that airs. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen. I'm not sure if it's live like it was before or they're going to air it in a, do, in a future date, um, but we'll give you guys that information. Also, uh, I know some of you guys give me a lot, of, a lot of heat about being on Ask the Pastor. I am on Ask the Pastor pretty frequently, normally on Friday, so if you got some time around 2.30 and you just want to see somebody on TV with a bald head, um, you can go to, the, uh, go to TCT and um, you can catch me on the panel with other pastors.
pastors, um, just taking questions, helping people process um, different things from the Bible and process things in their life. And so that's normally on Fridays um, when I can make myself available. Um, I believe I'm on this Friday coming up. Um, and so just so you guys can be in and know about that, I am on Ask the Pastor on Fridays on TCT. And uh, you can look at your local listing to find out what channel is TCC for you. Uh, but I will put that word out there. So, Sister Norma, am I good now? I ain't got to announce it anymore, do I? All right. I said it once, one and done. Y'all know now. You have been warned. No more. All right. So, that's this Tuesday. On this Thursday, we have our youth group night, so I want to remind um, all of our young people that's in middle school and high school, youth group will be this Thursday at 6.30. Parents, uh, Lord willing, you will begin to email with all the details about that, uh, but youth group will happen on this Thursday at 6.30. Um, again, I mentioned about the women's life group that's going to meet this Saturday at 10 o'clock. Ladies, please make sure that you connect with Sister Norma, I mean, I'm sorry, Sister Payne, or Sister Sh uh, Shalene, uh, they could give you all the information related to that. Um, and then next Sunday is a special Sunday for us because on next Sunday, uh, we are going to officially acknowledge Brother Tim and Brother Charles as deacons at Christ Community Church. Amen. Amen. So from next Sunday on, you could call them Deacon Charles. And Deacon Tim, right? <laughs> but we're really excited about that. Uh, we're going to have something special during the service, and then immediately after service, uh, we're going to just walk, uh, go and greet them, and just express our uh, con con congratulations. I can't speak today. Our congratulations to them, um, and we have a small little meal uh, refreshments uh, prepared for you guys um, on on that on that day as well. And so. Um, just want to uh, uh, make sure that I remind you guys that that's going to take place on next Sunday. Uh, we do have a bit of business to take care of related to that. Uh, the bit of business that we have to do related to that is after service today, we need all of our members. Um, there's a formality that we have to do. All of our members um, at the end of service today, I need you to stick around for about five, min five minutes as we just got to deal with some um, things pertaining to our bylaws as it relates to us bringing on new deacons. And so uh, it will take about five minutes, but I need for you guys to please make sure uh, that you uh, guys uh, stick around after service to let us know. Now, you guys trying to communicate something to me. Y'all telling me, go this way, that way. I am so confused. What is it? Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, and, um, and so... Uh, just want to um, make sure that you guys know what's going on on next Sunday. Please make sure you stick around today after service so you get all the information and so that you could be in the know of what's going to, uh, of what we're doing as we go through this formality, okay? And we have marriage group that's going to meet this Tuesday, okay? Thank you so much uh, for, for that. Also, at the end of this month, we have our annual business meeting. Uh, which is going to take place after service. I believe that Sunday is November the 27th. Um, it's going to be immediately after service. Uh, that's for our members as well. Every year we like to give an update on what's taking place in the ministry. So we invite you guys to please, um, if you can, uh, make sure that you clear your schedule for that particular Sunday so that you could be a part of the meeting that we're going to have for our members on November 27th. Uh, last announcement, I know there's a lot of announcements. The last announcement that I have is um, uh, many of you guys know that we are a part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. We're part of a, uh, a collection of other churches uh, that's committed to proclaiming Christ as Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and King. Uh, that's on the mission to spread the hope of the gospel. And we've been blessed to be able to partner with other churches to do this. Well, one of our sister churches is putting on a benefit concert to help... Uh, to raise some money for a building fund that they're putting together for their particular church. It's a church that's down the street from us. They're just south of us, right on Lee Road. Uh, as a matter of fact, sometimes their church get confused with our church uh, because we're both Alliance churches. We're both on Lee Road. The name of our church is Christ Community Church. The name of their church is Christ Centered Community Church. And so sometimes people get us all confused, uh, but they're good people that love Jesus and they sent an email out asking for some of the other local CMA churches to be a part of their benefit concert. So I want to give that out to the church body. Uh, we're already going to make a donation. 
um, to their building fund. We're going to help contribute to the work that they're doing. But I invite you guys as well to come out to that benefit concert. That's going to be on the last Saturday of this month. I believe that's the 26th. It's going to be at 7 o'clock. It's going to be at Christ-centered community church, which is also only road. Um, but we'll make sure we give you guys all the information so that you can have it if you want to be a part of that. They're bringing in a gospel singer um, to kind of uh, front to kind of be the front runner for this particular event. There's going to be other gospel acts as well. And so it would be a great time for us to just to be a blessing to another sister church, to be able to worship together, and to help contribute to another ministry. There is a ticket cost. I think it's $20 uh, per ticket to go to this event, but it's going towards their building funds. So we'll make sure we give you guys more information about that. But we just want to give you guys the heads up uh, to make sure that you clear your calendar for the last Saturday of this month uh, to be a part of um, this benefit concert if you're able to go to it at 7 o'clock at Christ Center the Community Church. I think that's all I have by way of announcement. So the worship team is going to come out and lead us in another song as we prepare our hearts for offering. Let me just say how much we really appreciate you guys so much for your contribution, for allowing the Lord to use you to help contribute to the work that God is doing here at Christ Community Church. Uh, thank God so much for how he's using you to help us move forward as a ministry. I just want to remind you that there are three ways that you can contribute to the ministry. You can give first by going to our webpage, which is worshipccc.com. Click on the Give tab, and you'll get all the instructions of how you can give that way. You can also text to give. If you want to text to give, just simply text CCC Giving to 73256. And then you can also, if you're in-house, you can give your contribution to the greeter in the back, and she'll make sure it goes to the appropriate place. Or if you're at home and you want to mail in your contribution, you can mail it into our physical location, which is 2065 Lee Road, Cleveland Heights, Ohio, 44118. Amen. God bless you. Let me just pray for us one, one more time, and then the worship team is going to lead us in the song of worship. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. Uh, Father, we thank you, dear God, for your patience in our lives. And we just pray, dear God, that you would uh, be pleased. Be pleased with this fellowship. Be pleased with this body. Be pleased with our worship. Uh, be pleased with the work that we do for your glory. Uh, we pray, dear God, that this offering that's offered up today, God, we pray that it will be used for the purposes of extending the kingdom of God. We love you, God, and we bless you in Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. Father, when we contemplate and think about the depth of our sin, the times, dear God, that we weren't thinking about you, we were doing everything contrary to your word. We were rebellious. We were cocky in our attitude towards you. We were prideful. We thank you, Father, that in spite of us, you still loved us. We thank you, dear God, that you in your love sent Jesus to die for our sins. He that knew no sin, talking about Christ. He became sin in the sense that he took on our sin so that we in return can be right with God. We thank you so much, Father, for your love towards us. And so, Father, we do cry out, have your way. We're empty cups. Fill us up. God, we want our lives to reflect who you are. God, God, we have been so touched and so moved by your love that it has changed everything about us. It has changed our focus, our disposition, 
our love, our commitment, our attitude. Because your love is just that powerful. And so, Father, we thank you so much for your love towards us. And, God, we know that you loved us because you love us for sure. But you loved us and kept us here so you can use us to spread your love to others. So, Father, we are empty cups. We are available to you. Use us how you see fit to bring you glory. We honor you, Father. We thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, church family. So good to be in the house of the Lord on this Sunday morning. Such a blessing to be able to commune with the people of God. And um, it's such an honor to be able to um, share this moment with you guys. And um, just really thankful to the Lord for the chance that we have week after week. You know, this is something that we should not take for granted. Uh, we shouldn't take it for granted the fact that we have this privilege of coming together to be able to worship, to be able to feast on God's word together. It is an honor, amen? It's not a burden. It's not something we should feel, feel compelled to do. It's something that we should feel very honored, and um, it's a blessing to be here. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, can you open it up, please, and join me in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And today we want to look at verse number 10. That's Matthew chapter 6. And we want to look at one verse today, and that's verse number 10. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 10. The word of God reads like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. May God add a blessing to the hearing and reading of his holy word. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited today because today we're going to start a new series on the family. And the name of this series is Kingdom Families. And this name is important because the name of the series describes the focus of this series. The name of the series describes the focus of this particular study. And so what I want to do today, if it's okay with you guys, is I want to start our journey in talking about kingdom families by unpacking the name of this particular series. And the main point that we want to make today, and really the point that we want to make throughout this entire series is that kingdom families are special. And the reason why is because kingdom families are conduits to spreading the kingdom of God. So that one more time. Kingdom families are important, not because they look good on pictures, but kingdom families are important because they are conduits to spreading the kingdom of God. What we mean is, is that the purpose of the family, check this out, church family, is greater than the family. The purpose of the family is greater than the family. Like everything else in creation, the family exists to bring glory to God. Now, that's a struggle for us, especially those of us in the West, because what's the American dream? To find a person that you like a lot, that looks really good, looks like a model, to have some babies with that person, to have a nice house with a white picket fence, to have a dog or a fish if you're in my house, and to be happy, to be everly, live everly, you know, have, you know, I can't speak today, happily ever after. There you go. Thank you. My eyes messed up and my mouth. We struggle with this because our perception of family is that family should, play, should be a place where we are happy. And certainly there is a sense in which in your family there is fulfillment, there is contentment, and there is happiness. But what we're going to argue in this series is that the family has a far greater purpose than just mere happiness. Matthew chapter 6 contains probably one of the most popular prayers in the world. This prayer is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. And the reason why is because it's where the Lord teaches us how to pray. 
But we have to be careful with that phrase because the Lord's Prayer almost implies that this is Jesus praying. And of course, we know this is not Jesus praying. This is Jesus teaching us how to pray. Really, the true Lord's Prayer is John chapter 17. That's where Jesus prays for us. But in this particular prayer, Jesus is teaching us how to pray. And so some people prefer to call this the disciples prayer. But we also got to be careful about that as well, because we have to make sure that we're not uh, insinuating in some kind of way that what Jesus is teaching us in this prayer is what we should say every time we pray. This prayer is not so much about what we should pray. This prayer is more of a model of, what, of how we should pray. And at the core of this prayer model, at the core of this prayer model is a request for the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, the kingdom of God is so essential to this prayer that some people prefer to call it the kingdom prayer. So you take your choice, the Lord's prayer, the disciples prayer, or the kingdom prayer. But the kingdom of God is essential to this prayer. I want you to notice in verse number 10 that the first request that Jesus teaches us in this prayer and the foundational request that he gives us in this prayer is for the kingdom of God. Look at what he says in verse 10. He says, your kingdom come. Notice that his first request is not for our kingdom or our agenda or our purposes or our needs. He's going to teach us how to pray for our needs. Certainly that's important. But the overall tone of this prayer is for the kingdom. He says in verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the question that's important as we process this particular prayer and as we go through this particular series is what does Jesus mean by the kingdom of God? What does he mean by your kingdom? Well, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, let me first of all says he, say he's not referring to a physical location. He's not saying may a physical location, physical location enter into the earth realm some kind of way. He's not saying may some type of alien foreign place come into earth and that's the kingdom of God. He's not referring to a physical location. He's not referring to some type of end time prayer. Like, would you hurry up and bring your kingdom He's not referring to that either, even though all of us wants that to happen. What Jesus is referring to when he talks about the kingdom of God, and you find this all throughout the Gospels, is the kingdom of God refers to the rule and reign of God manifested in the lives of believers. Now, this is an important point, so let me say it one more time. The kingdom of God refers to the rule and reign of God manifested in the lives of believers. What Jesus is teaching us to pray is God, may your rule and authority be displayed in my life. That's what he's teaching us to pray. He's teaching us to pray, Lord, may your rule, may your agenda, may your authority be made manifest in our lives. He's not telling us, uh, he's not telling us to uh, to pray, God, take us out this world, even though we might want to pray that. We don't want to be here anymore. Um, but what he's telling us is that we should pray, God, while we are in this world, may we act like citizens of heaven. He's not saying, God, take us out of this thing. That's what we want us to pray. I mean, with all the stuff that's going on in this world, all the polarization of politics, all the mess, the suffering, the pain, some of us would prefer Jesus to say, let your kingdom come and take us out of here. Come pick us up. But he doesn't teach us that. He says, while we are in this world, may we represent your kingdom. Because the fact of the matter is, like it or not, God has sent us on a mission to this world. This world is jacked up. It is messed up. It is toe up from the flow up. That's how this world is. And yet God has sent us as ambassadors on a mission to this world. Currently, there is one physical location where the rule and reign of God is recognized. And y'all know where that's at? That's in heaven, right? 
uh, uh, that, that's why Jesus teaches us to pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven, guess what? God's rulership and his authority is respected and recognized in heaven. In heaven. And so he teaches us to pray that just like they get down in heaven, may we also operate here in earth, on earth. But that brings up a very interesting question. And that is, doesn't God's will prevail on the earth? I mean, why would Jesus ask us to pray, may your will be done on earth like it is in heaven, as if the will of God does not prevail here on earth? I mean, what do we mean by the will of God? Well, it's an interesting question. The will of God, when you study the Bible very closely and when you say this prayer very closely, certainly refers to God's ends. In other words, the things that God is going to accomplish, what God is ultimately determined to happen, will happen. But that's just one slice of God's will. God's will certainly involves God's means. But how many of you guys know that God's will also involves God's means? His means to accomplishing his end. In other words, God's will refers to God's ends, what God has ultimately determined to happen, but it also involves God's means, how God wants it to happen. And God's will includes both the what, what he's going to do, and the how, how he wants it done. The what and the how. And God has determined what will happen and how he wants us to accomplish it. Here's, here's, here's what I mean. God's will will accomplish will be accomplished. His what will be accomplished. But God wants us to accomplish his will through certain particular ways. For example, it's God's will for us to pray. You know, there are certain things that God won't do until we pray. God has predetermined that it will happen, but God has determined that we will pray. That even though God is going to do it, he has determined that the means by which we do it is through prayer. You do know that God had determined for you to be saved. God chose you. You weren't thinking of God. Please don't think you're so intellectual, you're so smart, you're so good that you came out the womb saying, I want Jesus. No, you used to came out the womb saying, I want a cookie, right? But we don't come out the womb asking for Jesus. He pursues us. But check this out. That was God's ends, but God also determined that you would come to faith in him through somebody telling you about Jesus. Has somebody not been faithful to be the means by which God accomplished his ends, then you wouldn't have came to faith in Christ. Because God determines the ends and the means, how it happens. You do know it's God's will for us to be thankful. It's one thing for you to serve in the church. That's the what. But if you do it with a nasty, ungrateful attitude, you're not accomplishing God's will. You say, well, I'm getting it done. Yeah, you're getting it done, but you're getting it done in a way that's contrary to the will of God. You know, the Bible says it's God's will for us to give thanks in all circumstances. Not for all circumstances, but if you find yourself in a good season, praise God, give God thanks for that. But if you find yourself in a struggling season, praise God, thank God for that. Because God is moving in the good times as he's moving in the struggling times. In either situation, you still give thanks to God. You don't stop giving thanks to God because things are not going in your favor. You thank God that even though things are not going in my favor, I know you're working something out. So therefore, God, I know you're using this somehow, some way to accomplish something bigger in my life that I don't see, but I thank you for it anyway. It's God's will for us to love. It's God's will for us to serve. You see, the means by which God accomplishes things is just as important as the what. And the reason why the means are important is because the means by which God accomplishes his will reflects the kingdom of God. The way we do it reflects who we represent. It's not just that we do it, but the means by which we do it reflects our king. That's why it's important. God wants us to be so immersed 
in the kingdom of God that we smell kingdomly. Like people are like, what kind of cologne you got on? It's like it's the kingdom of God cologne. Like you're just so immersed. You know how it is when you go to Starbucks? I can always tell when somebody been at Starbucks because they got that strong coffee scent all over them. I'm like, man, you've been at Starbucks, haven't you? It's something about going to certain environments where something is so immersed, so thick, that if you come into that environment, you leave that environment spelling like the environment you came out of. Well, God wants us to be so immersed in the kingdom of God and embracing these values and living out these truths that when people bump up against us, they're like, man, you smell funny. You smell different. Say, that sin is the kingdom of God. I could get you one too. Smell like the kingdom of God. It's interesting. I don't want to get too weighty here, but it's interesting because the word in uh, Matthew 6 and verse 10, um, done, your will be done. That word done is a very interesting word in Greek. It's the Greek word genomai, genomai. And that word genomai means to cause something to be brought into existence. That's what that word means. We don't really, we can't really capture that in the English because we can't really get our minds around. We don't have a word that can really wrap around the full meaning of this word. But the word really means to call something to come into existence. Let me show you how this word is used in other passages so you can get the full force of this word. You remember in John chapter 1 when the, the Bible talks about in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was with, the word you know, was God and then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then it goes on to say that he came to his own, but his own received him not. But to those who did receive them, he gave them the right to become children of God. You remember that? Look at what he says here in verse number 13, John 1, 13. He says, who were born? Stop right there. That's our Greek word, genomai. Who were born? That's the Greek word, genomai. Not of blood, nor of the will of, of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know what this verse is saying? This verse is saying that there were people that were born again, shout out to Brother Dave Lyon, who came into a new existence because of the work of Christ. They were dead, but then they came into something new. And he uses our word, you know my. They were brought into a new existence. Let me show you where this word pops up at again. You remember in John chapter 8? When Jesus is having this dialogue with the Pharisees, and, and he tells the Pharisees that Abraham was able to see through time and see a day when Jesus will come, and he rejoiced in that day. And the Pharisees, they understood basic mathematics. Jesus was about 30-ish when he's having this conversation with them. And so the Pharisees said, you ain't even 50 years old yet. How you talking about Abraham saw your day? Boy, what are you talking about? Jesus says, John 8 and verse 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham, get on my, get on my, before Abraham was, before Abraham came into existence, before there was an Abraham, I am. What Jesus is saying, before Abraham, anybody even thought about Abraham, I was here. You know, when I was growing up, I knew an older person was putting me in check. When they told me that, boy, I've been doing this before you were even thought of. When they told me that, I knew I'm being put in check. Like, you've been doing it that long that before my mama even knew she was going to have a third son named LaVert Parker, you were still doing this? You've been doing this for a long time. I respect that. He says, before Abraham was, get on my, before Abraham was, it came into existence, before he was, I am. Here's what God wants. God wants us to bring into existence the values of the kingdom of God as we walk on this earth. That if there's a people on this planet where the kingdom of God is manifested and seen and displayed, it should be with us. God, may your will be done. What will? Well, of course, your, your end is going to be happening. That's going to happen, right? Whatever God determined to happen is going to happen. But may the other part of your will, the means by which you're going to accomplish those things, those values of the kingdoms, those characteristics of the kingdom, may those things be manifested in our lives.
We are called to make the kingdom of God visible on earth. And one sphere in which the kingdom of God should be manifested is certainly in the church, but it's also in the family. Did you know that your family serves a bigger purpose than just raising your kids and getting them out the house? Making sure they get a good job so they can give you a dollar or two when you need them. Making sure they're healthy so that when your health goes down, they can take care of you. Did you know that your purpose in raising those kids and being a part of that family is bigger than them getting that six-figure job so they can make you proud? So you can tell everybody, that's my boy. Or that's my daughter. That's my baby. Nothing wrong with those things. But if that was just the purpose of having a family, that is such a limited purpose. Because that means you only shine for a moment. Just in your moment of time, that's when you shine. I think there's a bigger purpose. I'm going to argue this from the scriptures. That your family exists, my family exists, so that the kingdom of God can spread. So God can work through the family to make his will be done on this planet the same way it's done in earth, I mean, in heaven. There are three institutions that God has established. Three. God established government. Like it or not, God established the government. You can't read the Bible and not draw that conclusion that God is the one who appoints at the end of the day, God is working out his will on this planet. And like it or not, you got to respect it. That's what the Bible says. It's funny, uh, we're not talking about this today. That might be fun for us to talk about for, on, on another day. But it's interesting when the Bible talks about respecting the government, giving honor to the king, at that particular time was probably the most corrupt government on this planet under Rome. And yet, what did the Bible tell us to do? Respect it. As a matter of fact, the government that the Bible tells us to respect when the Holy, the Holy Spirit inspired these writers to pen the Bible, the New Testament in particular, that particular government was so corrupt that it, it's the government that crucified Jesus. You would think the Bible would say, man, forget them. Don't show them no respect. Riot! It says show respect. Why? Because God established government. God also established the church. God established the church. Jesus says, upon his rock, I will build my church. He established the church. But do you know what's the foundation of the government? Sometimes I think our focus, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should not get involved with political things. I'm, I'm certainly not trying to go to that extreme. But sometimes I think that our focus become too misplaced. Because you know what's the foundation of the government? You know what's the foundation of society? It's the third institution that God established. That's the family. As a matter of fact, before the government, before the church, the first institution that God established was the family. For this reason, the man should leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they should become one flesh. And you know what's the consequence of one fleshness? Babies. Let's be, don't be super spiritual here, y'all. Y'all know what happens. First comes love. Then comes marriage. Help me out. Then comes the, the baby with the, ba the, the baby carriage, right? right? All up in there, right? God established the family. And I'm not saying we should not be involved with those other spears. Certainly we should. But the foundation of society has always been the family. And to the extent that we fix and address the issues in the family will be to the extent that we will see society corrected, adjusted, and fixed. Broken families contribute to a broken society. I don't care how much you try to patch up society, if you don't get to the core of it at home, you're not going to make much progress. The core of the church is the family. The family is just absolutely important. And the family is important because it's where values and character is being shaped. The family is important because ultimately that's where 
values and character is being shaped. I can't tell you guys. So you, many of you guys know I've worked in the schools, and many of you guys work in the schools. And I can't tell you guys how many times I try to correct a young person from doing something that I thought they shouldn't be doing, and their comeback, their rebuttal was, well, my mama told me. I, I, what am I going to do with that? I, I'm, I'm like, man, don't, don't, don't hit that boy. Well, my mama told me. If he sneezed on me, I hit him. I mean, I don't relate, you know, but well, I'm going to say your mama wrong. She was, but I got to figure out how do I tell a, a 10-year-old boy your mama wrong? But he's getting values, things that he's being taught at home that he's bringing to the schools. The family is important because it's where character, it's where values are being shaped, especially during the formative years of life. So we got to deal with the family. But that brings up a question. <laughs> what do we mean by family? I mean, we know what we mean by the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God manifesting in the lives of believers, but what do we mean when we talk about family? Well, of course, you know, family is connected by blood. We know you get a mom, dad, cousin, brother, sister, all that other stuff. But we also know that family is not just blood. You have people that's close to you that are not blood relative that you consider to be family. As a matter of fact, there are many types of families. There are the more traditional families with a mom, a dad, 2.5 kids, a dog, a fish, and a white pig and fist fence. You have that. But you also have blended families. You have families where grandparents are taking the lead. You have adopted families. You have single parent families. You have families where you have the aunts and the uncles that are involved. You have families where cousins and them are involved. Not to mention you have people that are single. You have people that are widowed. You have people that are engaged like Charles and Audrey. You have a number of different situations that can pose and make up a family. There are a variety of different types of family, families. So what are we going to address here? Here's the thing. Your particular situation may look different than somebody else's situation. But the unique thing to what God has called us to is that God has called us as a church to form one family. Now, here's the thing about the church. Here's the thing about the church. The church is composed of various types of units. Whatever your unit looks like, whatever your household looks like. Some of us are a part of a more traditional family style. Praise God. Some of us have a blended family situation. Praise God. Some of us, our grandparents are raising us or involved in family. Praise God. Some of us are uh, engaged. Some of us are widowed. Some of us are single. Some of us, we all have different types of situations. But the church is one big family composed of various types of smaller households. That when we come together, we form this family that God uses to extend and spread the kingdom of God. We come together to encourage each other in our particular units, whatever our particular situation looks like, to encourage each other, to help stimulate each other, to help cultivate amongst each other kingdom values so that whatever our particular situation looks like, God can work through that to spread his kingdom. Because God is not just working through traditional families. God is working through all types of families. As long as the adjective kingdom is in front of it, God is going to work through that particular household. So I want to make this very clear. In this series, we're not just talking about traditional families. We will. We will talk about parenting. But we will talk about all the variations of parenting. Because how many of you guys know one of the things I appreciate about the Bible is that the Bible presents the world as it should be, but then the Bible also addresses the world as it is. And some of us are in households where we're with a spouse and we're raising these kids together. But some of us, it's a little bit more complicated. 
Some of us got baby mamas, and we're trying to figure out this parenting thing. Did you know that God can work through your situation as well? It's not like God's like, oh, you blew it. You're not living with the child. I can't work you. No, 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 no. Don't you think that? As long as you have a kingdom perspective, God can work through that co-parenting situation. Some of us got baby daddies that are our trip. We bring people around. They're like, who's that man acting up? You're like, that's just my baby daddy. Y'all remember that song? Who that is? That's just my baby daddy. We got issues that are complicated. But the kingdom of God can be expressed in that as well. So, yeah, we will talk about the more traditional, what should be, but we'll talk about what is. And by the way, all of us come to Christ not in the what should be situation. We come to Christ in the what is situation. So this is no knock towards anybody. We all in this thing together. There's no judgment. We're one big family composed of smaller units. Some of us have more traditional families, and some of us dealing with some crazy baby mamas and baby daddies. We help each other out, and we spread the kingdom of God. So we're going to talk about parenting. We're going to talk about marriage. Some of us come out of marriage or in marriages that is the more stylized, the, the, the more, you know, polished situation where neither one of them had a boyfriend or a girlfriend ever in life. They never touched the pinky of a person of the opposite sex. And then they met somebody and they got married. They doing good. Praise God. We're going to talk about y'all. Praise God. Well, some of us have hit some bumps on the road. Some of us have had failed marriages. We don't talk about that. Please don't think none of what you went through or where you're in in life is a throwaway. God can work through that. As long as you are a kingdom person striving to have a kingdom household and a kingdom unit, God can work through your situation. So those of us that have the, the more polished, put-together story, we're going to talk about that. And for those of us that it's a little bit more complicated, we're going to talk about that. Some of us are in a season of life where we are grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents, and the story goes on because we keep on living. You still have a purpose, and we want to speak to that. Every variation, some of us are single, either because we're widowed or we were married and we're not married anymore, or we just not, we haven't gotten married yet. But just because you don't have a husband or a wife at home, or just because you don't have any children, does not mean that God won't work through your situation and that you don't contribute to this kingdom family thing. Yes, you do. The kingdom of God, that's, that the church is composed of various types of situations that God collectively brings together to accomplish his will. As a matter of fact, I want to argue in this series, and we're almost done here. This is going to be a tough series. Y'all pray for me. Because is there some, some things that's going to challenge how we look at the church and how we look at the world? But I'm going to back this up by scriptures. But, 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 but some of us, uh, you know, have to realize that, that at the end of the day, the church is just one big family. I came across this quote uh, that I wanted to share with you guys. The quote says this. It says, Jesus called the church, watch this, to be a family of families. Of different types of families. Lended families, adopted families. Single parent families, single person families. They're just a family of families. That's what we are. It goes on to say, today the church more often resembles a corporation or a mall of specialty shops than a family. Shame on us that we have made the church more corporate-like. When Jesus intended the church to be one big family, one big family. You know, I so appreciate how in the church, we call each other brother and sister so-and-so. That's, that's how I was raised in the church. I don't know about you guys. I was raised like that in the church. If a person was my age, I call them by their first name. What's up, Ray Ray? Like, I call them by their first name. But if they were older than me, so they wouldn't be so formal, I didn't call them Mr. or Mrs. I called them sister or brother. Matter of fact, 
in the church, if a person was really seasoned in life, they got the esteemed title of mother of the church. Y'all know that. We got some mothers in this church, right? No, no shame. We got some mothers in this church. Much respect. All right? I love how we use these family terms, and I encourage us to continue to do that because it reinforces that we are family. Many people, unfortunately, approach the church like it's a corporation. When you think about a corporation, you have a CEO. And oftentimes, the CEO is the pastor. Right? The pastor is supposed to be a CEO. You have a board. Right? You have workers. And you have clients. And, and, and many people approach the church as if their job is to be a client to evaluate if the CEO was doing his job. They, they, they come to church like, I want to make sure that CEO and the workers are putting together a good product. They come to church with a consumerism mentally set. I'm a consumer. Let me evaluate your product. Because if I don't like your product, I'll go somewhere else. I remember years ago, uh, during the early 2000s, when they were popping out a lot of gospel movies, and uh, some of the movies would so irritate me. Uh, I, I would just get so frustrated. And, and I remember one particular gospel movie. I saw it had all these big name actors and stuff. So everybody think it's going to be the bomb movie because so-and-so was in it. And I remember going to this movie. And it was, of course, it was about a struggling church. It was about a church that was struggling. They couldn't pay the bills. They about to shut the church down. And then somebody had the bright idea to say, you know what? What this church really needs is a good choir. Because that's what people like. People want to hear, they want to hear the bomb choir. And they had like one person that could sing. And they like try to rally around that one person could sing. Some other people that could sing and had the bomb choir. And I'll never forget this one part of the movie. It so hurt my heart. Because I'm like, is this how they see the church? It was this one part of the movie where they got their choir together. And it was on a Sunday. And their choir came out to the street. So the people could hear them sing. And as people was going down the street, it was a roll of churches. And every church had their choir outside, and people are going like, oh, I like that choir. I'm going to go over there. Oh, but I like that song. I'm going to go over there. Oh, no, I'm going to go to that choir because they got moves. And I'm like, is that really how they look at the church? Like, we're just putting together a product. Like, we got a nice choir come to us. We got a good choir. That's how people view it. And it takes away the family feel. Because what we are is family. Let, let, let me just say something real quick. Let me take the pressure off of us. Uh, because I used to feel this pressure a little bit. Like, we, we, we got to make everything polished and together because, you know, we got to put together a good product. Let me take some pressure off of us. First of all, what blessed me and I hope it blesses you is coming to the realization that whatever you catch somebody with, you got to keep them with. That pressure stays on. So if you've got the bomb choir, you got to keep having the bomb choir. Don't let that person that can sing really well get sick. Like, no, you got to come into church. You got to sing. People depend upon you. Don't let that person talk about I'm going to go to another church. Like, no, please don't leave. We're going to pay you money, please. If you catch him with anything other than Jesus, you got to keep him with that thing that's other than Jesus. If it's not the spirit of Christ that's roaming through this church, that's drawing people. See, here's the thing. This is not in the Bible, so please take it like that. But if the choir be lifted up, it will draw all consumers unto it. If the pastor be lifted up, it would draw all consumers to it. And when the choir leaves, the consumers leave. When the pastor leaves, the consumers leave. If the building be lifted up, it would draw all consumers onto it. But if the building catches on fire, or you have to shut down because of a virus, then the people leave as well. God in his wisdom, working through Jesus, communicate through Jesus that if he be lifted up, he would draw all men unto him. So what that means is if Jesus gone, they leave. But that's cool because Jesus should always be here. Choirs come and go. Amen, somebody.
Preachers come and go. Builders got issues. They break down. But Jesus is always the head of the church. Jesus, we have to be a family. Secondly, I, I want to encourage us too, as I encourage myself, did you know it's not your responsibility to grow the church? I told you I'm going to say some stuff that's going to be like a paradigm shift. You're like, what? Hold up, Pastor. What are you saying? You might have been dozing off. You're like, let me wake up now. Did you know it's not your responsibility to, start to grow the church? Now, let me be careful here. We are called to serve, to serve faithfully, to give our best, to do the very best that we can do. But it is not our responsibility to grow the church. Let me prove this to you from the scriptures. Jesus says, Matthew 16 and verse 18. He told Peter, he said, look, you are Peter. And when Peter gave the confession of faith, that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus says, and on this rock, this confession of faith, the pastor will build my church. That's not what the text says. The deacon board is going to build my church. Brother Charles and Brother Tim. That the, the, the choir is going to build my church. No, no, no. He says, upon this confession of faith, I will build my church. And you know what's the good thing about Jesus building this church? It's because nobody else can build this church and have this other part be true. If the pastor builds the church, then the gates of hell will prevail. And we know many of churches that were shut down because it, be, it was more people-oriented than God-oriented. If the choir builds the church, the church, the gates of hell will prevail. And we know many of churches, oh my goodness, to our shame, that have choirs that can sing like the best of them, but had all kind of immorality going on up in that choir. Somebody talking about man, sex in the city. Tell me, don't you talk about sex in the church, sex in the choir. Talking about sex in the city. <laughs> yeah, right. The gates of hell will prevail. But Jesus says, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell can't stop it. They ain't going to stop. Now nah, they're going to keep moving. They're going to accomplish what I call them to do. The gates of hell will not prevail against them. It's our responsibility to make disciples. It's our responsibility to communicate gospel truth. But it's not our responsibility to grow the church. So please, Christ Community Church, don't take that pressure off of you. Don't, don't feel like, ah, oh, man. No, 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 no. We do what God calls us to do. And we trust God to do what God will do. We have this in the Bible. You know that, right? I mean, in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says the believers back then was just living kingdom lives. Look at what the Bible says, Acts 2 and verse 46. It says, and day by day, these believers, early believers, were attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And notice what the Bible says. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day. Now watch this. Not those that were consumers. Not those that were coming for a product. But those who were being saved. Actual believers. You know what this, this passage is telling us? This passage is telling us that they were living kingdom lives out in the public because God did not call us to retreat or leave this world. He called us to engage and be in this world and to represent kingdom values to this world. And they were in the world representing kingdom values, just being kingdom people, and God blessed that community and was adding to their numbers people that were responding to the gospel, getting saved, and being discipled. No gimmicks, no, you know, flashy commercial, I'm not trying to knock those things, but they were just living life, and it had such an influence on the community, the community was like, what's going on with these people? And something different about them, they smell funny. The kingdom of God was working, and God added to their church daily. In this series, I want to challenge us to understand that we are a group of various families, different types of situations, 
Nobody's situation is better than the other because we all come to Christ as we are. So just because, please, don't be jealous because somebody's situation looks different than yours. Your situation is your situation, and God's going to use your situation as the situation that you are in. We are a collection of various types of units that may differ in how we look, but are equally the same in our purpose. And that is to have the kingdom of God displayed to us. In your particular situation, there are certain people that will only be receptive to the kingdom of God because of your situation. There are certain things people ain't trying to hear from me. You don't know nothing. I mean, you came out the womb and you married Kelly. Like, you don't know nothing else, right? That's how they look at me. You don't know, you ain't never been to no stuff. You ain't never been, you don't, I don't want to hear that from you. But oh, they will hear from somebody else. The story may be a little bit more nuanced. God can work through your situation. So we're going to talk about the various family expressions. But please don't hear me say, when I say kingdom family, don't have in your mind father, mother, three kids, a dog, a white fence, a nice home. Nah, let me throw a rock at that. When I say kingdom family, I mean a unit, whatever that unit looks like, just focus on the king, and God's going to work through that. You don't have to have that American dream to have God work through you. Matter of fact, I'm convinced that sometimes that American dream prevents God from working through you. You don't got to have that. I want to say as we conclude that our job is to cultivate kingdom values. When we come together, as one big church, as one big family. And by the way, I, you know, I would encourage this. This would be fun. You know, technically speaking, we don't go to church. We are the church, right? I mean, we go to a building, but we are the church. I know what we mean, and we all use that expression, so don't be all legalistic, all right? Somebody say, I'm going to church. I'm like, don't you say that. We ain't going to church. You are the, no, no, no. We know what we mean when we say that. But really, you know what we really are doing? When we go to church, we're going to family time because we're all family. That's what we are. You ain't going to church. You're going to family time. You're going to family meeting. We're going to family. Next time, on next Sunday, when somebody be like, what you doing on next Sunday? Say, I'm going to family. See what they say, right? Like, what are you talking about? You're going to family. But when we come to family, we stimulate kingdom values one to the other. We encourage each other in the kingdom of God. Why? So that God can work through us to spread kingdom values. Matter of fact, I'm going to argue in this series. Oh, my God, I got so much to say, and I got to wrap this up. God, I'm going to argue in this series that whatever your household situation is, God is restoring it, but not so that you can have the picture-perfect family, but so that God can work through your family to spread his kingdom. So much of family and marriage talk is so limited because the end goal is for you to have a fa happy family and a happy marriage. I will argue that's just part of it. That's a very small part of it. Certainly, you know, you want to have a workable family and a workable marriage. You certainly should be at a place of joy and contentment with one another. You certainly should be able to live with each other, right? I mean, if you're going to represent the kingdom values and represent the kingdom of God, people should know at least you like each other somewhat. That don't represent the kingdom. They love Jesus, but they hate each other. That's not a good testimony. We need to work on that. Can y'all like each other at least? But the end goal is not for you guys to like each other and listen to slow music and have all this fun. The goal is for you guys to have a good marriage or have a good family so that you could be about the business of spreading his kingdom. The goal does not stop at the restoration of your family. The goal continues on 
through a restored family for the kingdom. When you have that bigger vision, boy, I'm getting ahead of myself. Just give you guys wetting your appetite so you can know what's to come. When you have that bigger vision, if you are a husband, you should strive to be a godly husband. Not just so that you can have a happy marriage, but because God uses godly husbands to advance his kingdom. And you being all caught up in your emotions, and you being called all caught up in your little anger, is preventing God to extend his kingdom. So not only are you making that woman mad, but you upsetting God. That's why the Bible says if you got an issue with your wife and you try to pray to God, husbands, God, like, that's a reject. God is like, she mad at you and I'm mad at you too. You not advancing anything. You ain't making nobody happy. Get your attitude together, brother. Fix your marriage so you can pray to God and God answers your prayer so we can be about kingdom business. Wives, come on now. Y'all like, amen on the brothers. What about the wives? God wants you, woman of God, to be a godly wife. Why? Not just to make him happy, but so that God can work through you to advance his kingdom. You being nasty, cutting people with your words, stubborn. Come on, don't want to cook a meal, not even put it in the microwave. It's not only starving your husband and your marriage, but it's stopping the purpose of the kingdom. You see, when you have that bigger vision that is not just about having a happy household, but it's about God working through my household to spread his kingdom, then it can motivate you to get yourself together. As a matter of fact, this is the last thing I will say and then we're done. So much, I'm, so, I, I, I'm nervous about this series, but I'm excited about it as well. Because you're going to say some stuff that's going to challenge your paradigm. Here's one of those things. Did you know, now I hope y'all love me after this. All right, got that swollen eye, so I might get another swollen eye after this, right? Be on TCT, on live TV, all jacked up. But did you know that your calling is not just about you or for you? But your calling, oftentimes, is in relationship with the calling of others. Let me read you this quote I came across. Paradigm shift. Quote says this. God's calling is not individualized. That's how we tell it. God's calling me. As if it's in isolation from others. God's calling is not individualized and personal, but rather corporate and interdependent. The reason why we need to talk about the family expressing the kingdom of God in the context of the bigger family, the church, is because our calling is interwoven together. In other words, you can't do what God called you to do without me. Now, you might not like me, you might think I'm, I'm something, whatever you fill in the blank. But you can't fulfill your calling without me. I can't fulfill my calling without you. We are interdependent with each other. I mean, is this not what our brother shared with us last week? That as you shine your light, whatever God's called you, whatever gift the Holy Spirit gave you, God has called you to, as you shine your light on another believer, that encourages them. And as they shine their light on you, that encourages you. And so both of you guys shining the light on each other are able to fulfill your calling. It's interdependent. And that's the reason why we got to talk about the family. Because whatever God has called you to, your family got to be, your unit, your household got to be somewhat in order. Too many people are in ministry. And their households are all jacked up. And we don't have time to go through all this, but we will in the weeks to come. But isn't it interesting 
that when God wants to appoint a leader in the church, that one of the first things God look at is their family. The Bible says a man want to be an overseer, he want to be a bishop. You know, brothers want to be a bishop nowadays. You want to be bishop so-and-so, bishop Parker. This is what the text says. Any man aspire to be an overseer, to be a bishop. You aspire. You want that position. You want that. You better be a one-woman man. You want to be a bishop, but you sleep with everybody. Well, I can preach. I look good in a suit. I still got hair. You may preach, look good in a suit, and still have hair. But if you ain't treating that woman right, you are disqualified. I want to be a bishop. But my kids are crazy. I shouldn't say that. That means I say crazy. <laughs> that was wrong. I'm sorry, y'all. I shouldn't say crazy. My kids are not behaving correctly. <laughs> All right. All right. Is that a little bit better? All right. All right. You don't spend no time with them. You're not involved in their lives. But I can preach. I look good in a suit. And I got hair. But you are disqualified. Because the Bible says that brother got to be able to manage his household. I wonder if the reputation of pastor kids... Y'all know the reputation of pastor kids, right? Off the chain. Am I right? Y'all know they, they, they pastor kids be the worst ones. I wonder if that reputation is real because we don't take the Bible seriously. And before we appoint somebody to such a special position, that we like, how are you with your family? Do they know your name, man? Or are you always at the church, helping somebody else out, building resentment in them? The only way they can get your attention is if they do something crazy, like throw an egg, egg at the window or something. God appoints leaders that are family men because the church is one big family. The church is not one big corporation. It's not one big organization. It is one big family. And the person most qualified and equipped to help lead and serve a church is a person that is committed to family. I don't care how well he preaches. I don't care how good he looks in the suit. And I don't care how much hair he has. If he's not a family person, he shouldn't serve. My hope in this series is that we will walk away from this Number one, understanding that we have a part to play in this movement. My hope really is that no one will feel like because I don't have this model of a family, because my story is not squeaky clean, because my family situation is a little bit more complicated, there's some kind of way that God can use me. No, 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 no. If you put the king first, if whatever your household is, has the adjective kingdom in front of it. Kingdom single parent. Kingdom blended family. Kingdom single person. If you had an adjective kingdom in front of it, that God wants to use you as a conduit to spread the kingdom of God. I'm excited about this series. I hope you guys are too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had in your word to contemplate the truth of the scriptures. And Jesus, we do pray. <laughs> uh, we pray your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, we want to be kingdom people that represent the values of the kingdom of God. May you use us for the purposes of extending your kingdom, and your reign, and your rule. May your authority be manifested in our lives. Jesus, we so love you. 
we understand we have a bigger purpose than our own happiness. That we exist for you. And so use us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're getting ready to wrap up our service. Thank you guys so much for your patience. Just a few things we want to do um, before we conclude. The first thing is, today is First Sunday, and so we do want to take some time to honor um, the Lord in communion. So the guys are going to go ahead and get that together. The second thing is, following communion, um, I need for our members, if you can, to stick around for about five minutes. I just need to go through some formalities related to bringing on uh, Charles and Tim as deacons next week. So we need you guys to stick around for that. And then that'll be, that'll be yes. So brothers, if you guys go ahead and start um, distributing the elements, that'd be great. And um, we could just take a few moments just to reflect on Jesus as we prepare ourselves for communion. Thank you. Amen. You know, communion is such a special time because it's a time for us to remember what Jesus did for us. And it's a time for us to reflect on the fact that no matter how long you have been saved, you never outgrow the need for the blood. We always need Jesus. And every time we take communion, it is a reminder that the same blood that saved us when we first got saved is the same blood that's sustaining us as we are saved right now. The Bible says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Can we take out the bread together? Jesus, thank you for offering your body so that we can be redeemed. We don't take it for granted. We love you. Amen. Can we take it together? The Bible goes on to say, in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Can we take the cup all together? Jesus, thank you for your blood being shed for us. We'll never know how much it costs to see our sin upon that cross. Thank you, Jesus. Can we take it together? 
The Bible goes on to say, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Thank you so much, church family. Uh, the uh, deacons to come around, brothers to come around, or sister uh, Washington to come around and collect your uh, communion cups. So if you can just pass to the outer aisle, that'd be great. Um, I want to pray for us one final time, and then um, again, I'm going to ask for all of our members, if you can, to stick around. In about two or three minutes, we'll come back together and just go through some formalities that we have to do, and then we'll release you guys. Would you guys mind standing? You've been sitting for a while. Would you guys mind standing? Thank you. Stretch it out a little bit. Some of our guys who play basketball may stand up a little bit slower. Uh, don't laugh at them. Just give them a helping hand. Father, again, we thank you so much for this time that we've had to be in your word and to feast on the scriptures. And we ask you, God, that the things that we have learned and the things that we've talked about, God, we pray that those things will resonate in our hearts. We pray, God, that we can, um, as we talked about earlier, be available vessels for you to use for the purposes of extending your kingdom. And while everybody's head is bowed, everybody's eyes closed, I do want to offer, if there's someone here that's like, man, I want to get more information about this Jesus, I want to invite you to come see me after service. Uh, we, we do have a meeting, but we will give time to talk about Jesus. So if that's you, just come see me, and I would love to talk with you more about who this Jesus is. But Father, we thank you so much. We praise you. We honor you. We, we give you glory. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory both now and forevermore. And all the other God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, church family, please stick around. In about two or three minutes, we'll meet together. Thank you.